The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion on identifying and correcting some common accounting issues in Design Manager. My name is Brad, and I'll be hosting the demonstration. If you have questions during the webinar, feel free to enter them into the questions or chat pane on your GoToWebinar panel. If the question is outside of the scope of today's discussion, please email them to support at designmanager.com. And lastly, if you miss a portion of the webinar or want to review any of our past discussions, you can go to our Help Center at knowledge.designmanager.com, select the Webinars menu, and go down to Recorded Webinars, and you can see any of our recent past discussions. You can also go to our YouTube channel at Design Manager Inc., Design Manager INC. And here you can review any of our past discussions uh, and tutorials at your leisure. Today's webinar will be focusing on accounting situations that uh, arise repeatedly in our technical support department. And we're going to examine many such scenarios and how to properly handle them as they prevent themselves and also how to correct transact transactions that may have been input improperly. One common error uh, area of accounting concerns revolves around returns and credits, both to your client and from your vendor. In fact, such scenarios are so common that we actually have created two separate webinars for the topic, one focusing on returns from your vendors while the other focuses on crediting your client. And you can find those at any time at our YouTube channel, again, Design Manager Inc where we have Advanced Accounting Course 3, Refunding or Crediting Your Client, and likewise, Advanced Accounting for Vendor Returns and Credits. Now, it's important to remember that I am not an accountant. Any of the scenarios that we examine today that apply to you should really be reviewed with your accounting professional first to ensure that they want uh, various transactions recorded in the manner that we discuss. For all examples, I'm going to try to show how to access the proper windows in both Design Manager Cloud and Design Manager Professional Cloud. And lastly, you'll note that a common theme of many of the scenarios today is selecting the proper type of account when entering transactions. So I'll be sure to really uh, reinforce that notion throughout the discussion. So really in no particular order, let's review some of these common uh, accounting issues. Let's begin with the concept of an owner's draw. Now this occurs when you're paying yourself or the principal or principals of the company directly from company funds. So we need to reflect that we have reduced the proper bank checking asset account and along with properly indicating that the owner has removed the funds from the company. So first, we must have an owner's draw equity account. So let's go to our chart of accounts, which in Design Manager Cloud, we go to glossaries, accounts, and there they are. And for our professional users, we'd go into our accounting tab, general ledger frame, accounts. And there they are. Equity accounts, which is what a uh, owner's draw account would be, are generally begin with a three in generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP for short. What is an equity account? Well. Uh, that usually represents the capitalized portion of company assets that belong to the owner or principal. Something uh, as the owner's draw, and there's our owner's draw equity account, that really represents what value has the owner or principal removed from the company? What portion of those assets have they taken away? In my preferred method of uh, recording an owner's draw, next we need to uh, be sure that we have a vendor or a um, that's graded for the owner or principal as we're actually be paying them as we do with traditional vendors. So in that case, we go back under glossaries, vendors and payees. There's our vendor glossary. And as you can see, I've created a vendor to represent myself as the principal of the company. And for our professional users, you could go into your project tab and go into your lists and glossaries to vendors. And there again, we can see myself as a vendor in the, that we can use for the company. 
But notice, if we go to the Defaults tab, that I have attached that Owner's Draw Equity account in the Expense account. This is going to help us out momentarily, and we'll see how it does so. So to pay myself as the owner, we're going to need to make an operating expense. So in Design Manager Cloud, we go to Documents and Accounting. We'd go under the Vendor View, and there I am. Now we can just click the Vendor Invoice button, or pardon me, the Expense or, or Bill button. And that gets us to our Operating Expense window with myself listed as the vendor. For our professional users, as many of you know, of course, you'd go under your accounting tab and click your bills and invoices button to get to the same window. So I'll actually be paying myself with a check, let's imagine in our example. So we could go ahead and fill in, I don't really have an invoice number, but I'd put in something like July draw perhaps. For the invoice date, today's date is just fine. And my transaction description, as many of you know, um, are completely optional, but I find them extremely helpful when I'm reviewing information that I may have entered in a weeks or even months prior. I could put July draw there as well. And now I just need to enter in the amount and the account distribution. And to do so, we click our add button as indicated by the green plus sign. And lo and behold, we can see that owner's draw equity account is already positioned and filled in at the account number for us. By putting the account number of the equity uh, owner's draw account onto the expense account of the vendor window, Design Manager automatically defaults that for us. So I don't have to remember to choose that each time and I know I'll be entering all of my information in properly, consistently and accurately. And let's say it's a $1,500 draw. Click OK, and if we click OK again, there is our operating expense. And then I could actually make a check like I would do to any vendor. Just jump over to our, our pay bills checkbook, and on our checking window, our pay bills tab, there I am. Tag to select, hit our checks button, select our checking account, and we're ready to go. There's my check for $1,500. I could print this off onto my actual check form and cash at my leisure. Now in the professional platform, on our bills and invoices window, I've actually created the exact same expense for myself. So I could just go ahead and post it at my leisure. Same exact procedure. So what is the effect of all that? Well, by the time I actually go and process and print that check, I'm gonna be reducing the appropriate cash uh, checking asset account. And I'm also gonna cause the owner's draw equity account to be a, uh, this is a bit of an oxymoron, a larger negative value, which represents a withdrawal of the worth of the company. As, a, as an owner, I'm effectively pulling out some of those funds from the company's total value. And you can see on our checking window, there's my check. And of course, that's reducing my overall balance due. I'm part of me my overall checking balance. And if we look at our account glossary, let's take a look at our owner's draw equity account using our balances window. We can see I'm pulling out funds. And we can also see that on our balance sheet, which I will attach to my favorites reports by clicking the add to favorites as we'll be going back and forth there a few times today. And we can see our owner's draw, how that appears on our balance sheet. Let's make that a little bit bigger. As I said, this is a larger negative value. So it's actually reducing the equity of the company. So each time I pull an owner's draw, I'm reducing my cash, checking up my assets, and I'm balancing that off as a reduction in the equity of the company as well. 
Now, this could also be performed as what is known as a journal entry. If a check does not need to be actually written, if I could just um, transfer funds between my personal account and the company's account, I could do this with a journal entry. And I actually have that over in the professional platform under our accounting general ledger frame, journal entries. Here's an entry for our July draw. And if we look at that, what am I doing? I have two accounts in here. There's our cash checking, and I'm crediting or reducing that by our 1500 And there's our owner's draw, which I'm debiting. That debiting of that equity account makes it a larger negative. If we go ahead and post that, we can also see, look at our account balances. There is that $1,500 reducing our owner's draw or making that a larger negative and the same effect on our cash checking account there is the 1500 crediting that account or reducing the balance so if you're comfortable with journal entries which by which inherently do require a bit more um, accounting overall knowledge to ensure that you're crediting the proper account or debiting the proper account as whatever the case may be it does allow you to accomplish the same task as you're affecting the accounts uh, directly. Owner's draw, very common, very simple, but they need to be properly recorded, of course. Now, what if we think about the opposite scenario? Let's say with that we're going to be the owners bringing funds into the company. And there are going to be times in the company's existence, particularly at the inception of the company uh, or during uh, unfortunate lean cash flow periods or simply to reinvest where the owner or principals or even officers want to put funds into the company. When funds are coming in to the company that are not associated with a project, they nearly always go through what we call miscellaneous cash receipts. And for our professional users, that would be found again under our accounting tab, but now under our accounts receivable frame, our cash receipts button. And rather than the more common add, you would click the add miss or add miscellaneous cash receipt. And for our DM cloud users, you would go to documents and accounting, switch over to your journal entries and miscellaneous cash receipt view, and there's our miscellaneous cash receipts, so we can create a new one. So let's say that I um, am putting, oh, I don't know, perhaps another $15,000 uh, back into the company, and I'm going to simply write a check out of my personal account. So I would fill up my cash receipt window, payment type of check, check number. Name, uh, funds from owner, the amount I said 15,000, transaction description, again, entirely optional, but I'll use the same as the name. And that leads us to the offset account. Well, we know we're going to be affecting our cash uh, checking asset account just simply by selecting our payment type. But we need another account that we're going to input through the offset account. And this is, again, one of those areas where we must tell design manager which account we want to use. And essentially, the question here is, what is the other side of this transaction? Or, more simply, where is the funds coming from? So let's use our search button here and get to our chart of accounts. One option that I have seen um, in the past is we could still use the same owner's draw account. Now oh, that sounds a bit, um, a bit like a uh, a reversal because we were just using that to withdraw funds, but we could use it as the opposite, where I'd be putting funds into that, indicating that I'm reinvesting equity into the account. Some other accounting professionals would rather have you do use a um, a liability account, such as a loan from owner or a loan from officers. This indicates that it's a liability, just like an account's payable or a credit card that needs to be returned to the owner or officers at some point in the future. Either way, if you're using the draw account, the draw equity account, or a uh, loan from owner liability account, 
the effect on the balance sheet is essentially the same. And it really just determined, it really um, is up to your accounting professional what they'd rather use. Now, I personally prefer using the loan from officer or loan from owner because I want to track what's been recorded as a loan separately from draw payments. So when the company ultimately starts repaying the owner in the future, I can use the loan from officer account first until the loan is paid in full. And then any other payments out to the owners can go back to be using the draw account. Uh, you'll also commonly see a um, another equity account called common stock. That's only should only be used when stock certificates are truly issued by a legal, a legal professional and their stock being sold into the company or out of the company. So that's a, a much more rare circumstances. So let's use our loan from owner. And lastly, there's even some checks and balances on this window as well. As much as Design Manager can, it's going to try to prevent you from uh, using an inappropriate account here. For example, I might be putting in my cash receipt and I could be confused as to what goes into the offset account. And I might say, well, I want to put it into the checking account, of course. Well, the payment type is already determining the checking account or what asset account to which the funds are going to go into. So in that case, Design Manager is automatically going to block you and say, hey, you cannot use the same account um, as the offset for which the payment type is already associated. So there are some uh, checks and balances there as well. Let's go back to our loan account and we're ready to go. Click OK. And in the professional platform, we just want to post that through. Again, this could be entered as a journal entry as well, but you do need a little bit more familiarity with the accounts uh, and how to credit or debit them properly. And you do lose a little bit of uh, detail there. For instance, a journal entry, you can't put a check number in, those types of things, but the effect would be the same. And what is that effect? Well, by putting in the miscellaneous cash receipt, we're gonna increase the cash account associated with the payment type. And we're also going to increase the loan from officer account. This represents an increase in the um, current liquid capital as the company is getting assets and it's balanced by the debt that's owned to the owner or principal. And we can see right on our cash receipt window, there is the 15,000 going in and it's going to be increasing our 10,010 cash checking account. And in our payment distribution in the bottom, we can see that the offset account is going into the loan from officer. And if we look at our account balances, there's our loan from owner. And there's a $15,000 credit there. And then the credit on a liability account increases that account. And if we look at our balance sheet, Take a look at how it appears on that document. So our cash checking has gone up by 15,000 and we can see our loan from owner is a $15,000 liability. Just like sales tax, client deposits, our credit cards, that's those are funds the company is ultimately uh, liable for. So two sides of uh, the same coin taking funds out using owner's draw and putting funds back into the company uh, from a loan from an owner, officer, or principal. Speaking about other transactions involving owners, another common um, question our technical support department may receive is what happens when an owner does purchasing for themselves through the company? Now, this is a bit of a tricky one. And this is why this is discouraged as personal expenses really should be separated from business expenses. In fact, I'll go as far as to say is do not do this without discussing with your accounting professional. If such, if such purchases are not properly recorded, um, they really can lead to a large accounting issue come tax time. So it's highly discouraged, but in uh, practicality, it does come up from time to time. So here's how to handle that. Jump over to our Design Manager Cloud again. 
And let's take a peek at our vendor tab under Century Furniture. I've already created such a scenario. So here is a operating expense and um, a debit card payment on that expense. And as you can see, we have a $3,000 bill. We purchased six chairs and two of them are for home use for the owner. This is a good example because not only does it allow us to correct how this transaction was entered, but also how to properly uh, input purchases for the company as well. So if we look at our accounts again, we have a furniture asset account. These are any um, pieces of furniture that are actually attributed to the company itself. We've bought on behalf of the company, they're in uh, the company usage, and they're an asset of the company. And if we look at our balances again, there's our $3,000, fantastic. So the expense itself was put in fairly correctly. If all six chairs were for their company, this would be perfect, but they're not. Only four of them are. So we don't want the cost of all six in that asset account. Really, we should have the cost of four of them, while two should be attributed to the owner in some manner. So we need to correct this uh, inconsistency. In this case, the easiest and, and um, uh, most direct method of correction would be to enter a journal entry because we want to truly reduce that furniture asset account and increase our familiar owner's draw account. So rather than the owner taking funds out of the company, they actually took two chairs, but the effect is the same. So let's make a journal entry to do so. And with journal entries, I always like to say, uh, they give you great power in the fact that you can immediately affect balances on account, but they should, with that power comes great responsibility because uh, if journal entries are used incorrectly, uh, the account may be correct, but a client's um, open uh, a client's deposit or accounts receivable accounts could uh, no longer be reconciled or you could uh, simply not be using the proper accounts and creating a whole uh, mess of other problems down the road. So if you're not familiar with them, it's best not to use them and, and contact us or your accounting professional for a little assistance. But there are circumstances where they're very convenient and here's one of them. So let's jump over to our journal entries and miscellaneous cash receipt view. Click on our journal entries folder and our journal entry button. Now every journal entry has an entry number and we just default one for you, but some people like to change that to their own numbering system. I sometimes put in an acronym for something like adjust furniture asset, the entry date, I would like to put this back in April when the original expense was recorded, but always uh, take care when entering a transaction into the past, particularly, of course, if you're leaning towards putting it into a uh, different fiscal year for which you may have recorded your income taxes on. That would be a uh, generally a, a uh, something you want to avoid at all costs. Uh, in fact, in the professional platform, you can actually block certain users for putting transactions into the past, and uh, it may not, they might not be able to do it at all. So always take care when you're what we call back posting or posting uh, or entering a transaction into the past, dated into the past. Transaction description, how about reclassify cost of chairs? Sounds fairly descriptive. And now we're going to use our Add Distribution button to tell Design Manager which accounts we want to affect. And every journal entry, well, every fiscal transaction, quite honestly, has at least two accounts associated with it. In this case, our first account is going to be our Furniture Asset account. Assets generally have a uh, debit balance, so to reduce them, we would credit it. And let's say the cost of the two chairs that the owner has taken were $800. I'm going to use my OK Add button, which is going to save my first distribution and allow me to enter the next one. And now we're going to put the 800 into our owner's draw. 
since I've already credited our furniture asset account, my net debits and credits is showing a negative. In other words, more credits than debits. So I want to debit the owner's draw account, which again makes that account a larger negative value, indicating that I'm taking more funds out of the company, out of the assets of the company. Click OK, and there's our two accounts. And you always have your net debits and credits at the bottom, and those, of course, must equal zero. Click OK, and there we go. And now, let's take a look at our furniture asset account balance. We can see it has been reduced by our $800 appropriately. And our owner's draw equity account also has increased by our 800. So again, imagine on our balance sheet, we're pulling more funds or reducing the equity or overall worth of the company. And for our professional users, I've done the same. Over on our accounting tab, the general ledger frame, here's our journal entries window. Here is our journal entry I've already entered. This is exactly how I did in our Design Manager Cloud. And for our professional users, it's not just the entry date that's important. In fact, even more importantly, usually, is the fiscal month. So I'd want to drop that back into April or fiscal four. And if we look at the journal, we can see exactly what we're doing. In this case, we're crediting or reducing our furniture asset account and debiting or further uh, increasing the negative value of our owner's draw. And then we'd simply post. So uh, lastly, another good example here, as I said before, this is us correcting that, um, this is correcting the purchase that the owner used to get the chairs out of the company. But we could have entered it in properly to begin with. And here's how it would look. On our accounts payable frame bills and invoices, here is our expense for Century Furniture. And what I did, notice, here, I have two account distributions. Rather than our original where we saw all 3,000 was for our furniture asset account, I simply split the distribution into the 2,200 that goes into the company's asset and the 800 that goes into the owner's draw. So I could have created this properly from the beginning. That's exactly an example how to do so. And if we look at the journal here, we could see the exact same effect where we're, we're putting 2,200 into the furniture. Let's make that a little bit bigger. We're putting 2,200 into the furniture asset account, and there's our 800 going into our owner's draw account. So that would be the initial way to do the entry properly from the onset. Okay. Miscellaneous cash receipts in general uh, have many uses. And we get questions on them quite frequently. Uh, we saw how we can use a miscellaneous cash receipt for the owner putting funds into the company to reinvest or what have you. But they can be used for other uh, functions as well, particularly, and a common occurrence we get is commission checks that may come in. Like I said uh, a little while back in our discussion, any funds that come into the company that are from non-client sources are generally put through the miscellaneous cash receipt company. Uh, pardon me, mass miscellaneous cash receipt window. So let's say we have a deal with one of our vendors that uh, if we sell a particular amount of transaction, they're going to give us a commission. So we go over to our accounts receivable tab, the frame, cash receipt window. There's our miscellaneous again. And let's imagine that it's a check just as we did before. Check number. Name, commission is simply fine for that. 
we'll use transaction description of commission as well, and the amount, the offset account. Again, this is the area where the common accounting issues tend to arise. People are not sure where to put a commission check. Like we said with the owner's draw, what is the source of these funds? Commissions really are a source of revenue, so we should have an account reflecting that. We use our accounting search. Generally, revenue accounts begin with a four in gap accounting, and we can see a whole variety of revenue accounts, and there is one already created for commissions. If you don't have a commission account created, you can always add one. Just input the proper account number, name, and the type, and you're good to go. So if we select our commission's revenue account, click OK. Let's take a look at our journal here. What would the effect of this miscellaneous cash receipt be? Well, we're going to debit or increase our cash checking account, and we're going to credit or increase our commission's revenue account. Revenue accounts traditionally hold a um, credit balance, so if we credit that account, it will increase it. Let's go ahead and post that. And by doing so, we're really uh, increasing the company's overall revenue and ultimately then net income. And we'd be taxed on that by the federal and state governments, of course. But if we look at our income statement, financial statements, income statement, let's add that to our favorites. Now, the income statement is the flip side of our balance sheet. This is showing us our, our revenue, cost of goods sold, and operating accounts. So we can see under our revenue accounts, there's our commissions account, and we've increased it by $100. So our income from operations is also going up appropriately. Commissions, very common, very easy. Miscellaneous cash receipt works perfectly in those circumstances. Speaking of cash receipts, our technical support staff frequently gets questions on how to input a check or other payment from the client when it doesn't match the deposit requested for a proposal or the invoice balance exactly. Let's put through a couple of those receipts um, and doing so will actually lead us to our another accounting issue. So let's hop back over to our Design Manager Cloud, stay on our Documents and Accounting window, but let's go to our Projects tab, and let's select our Carter's Pennington Home Project. Let's go down to one of the proposals. And we can see, here's our outdoor living area proposal. And if I look at our information node, we can see that we've requested uh, 2,340, but our total actual deposit received is currently zero, indicating that the client hasn't given us any funds yet. So let's imagine that they just um, sent a check for $2,500. Even though we asked for 2,340, they decided to round it up. Fantastic. How do we handle that? Well, very similar to if they gave us the exact amount. We'd still highlight our proposal and click our cash receipt button. The amount is always going to be the amount of the receipt itself. It doesn't matter if it's not exactly what we asked for. That's the amount of the check or wire transfer or whatever pet payment method the client provided. So that gets entered first. And if we just say they gave us a check for convenience, we can do so. Put in a check number. Today's date is just fine. Now I already have my proposal selected or tagged. And we can look at our totals region and we can see we're expecting 2340. But the receipt itself is 2500, so we have a difference of $160. I'm going to be prevented from proceeding. Design manager is going to say, hey, that check is for $2,500 and you've only allocated 2,340. You need to tell me where to put the rest of those funds. So I could do a few things and it really depends on what the client wants me to do. 
but I could put the $160 as an unallocated retainer. I would highlight my retainer line, click the edit button as indicated by the pencil, put in 160, transaction description, slight overpayment, something to that effect. And by tagging, now my total deposit and retainer equals the amount precisely, the difference is zero, and I could proceed. But let's imagine that we want to put the whole $2,500 onto the proposal itself. The client's giving us the funds for that proposal. Let's allocate it there. So in that case, simply select the proposal itself, hit the edit button, and now we just want to change the amount from the original deposit requested amount of 2340 to 2500 And again, slight overpayment is the transaction description. With our proposal deposit still selected, now we have $2,500 of deposit matching our amount, our total receipt, and our difference is zero. And now I can proceed. We can see the deposit itself. And notice that even on our proposal node, we see that we asked for 2340, but we actually have 2,500 associated with the proposal. And if you look at our proposal status window, we can see how much we requested for each of the items and how much they truly received. And what Design Manager will do it's going to take that extra, um, those extra funds and distribute it proportionally to each item based upon the requested deposit amount. So, for example, our bar stools, we requested 910, the most out of all the items, so it got the most out of the additional funds. So, Design Manager is distributing a piece proportionately to all of the items. Let's do the same scenario, but let's think about a payment on an invoice. And we'll go over to professional platform for that one. And we, of course, we'd stay on our accounting tab, go into our accounts receivable and back to our cash receipts. But now we're not focusing on our ad miscellaneous, but our more common ad button. Go ahead and put in an invoice for one of our clients. And on our payments on invoices grid at the bottom of the window, let's say that there is um, a bounce due of 1,158.28, but the Carters only gave us a check for 1,150. So just like we saw in Design Manager Cloud, what is the amount? Exactly what they gave us on the check, 1,150. Today's date is just fine. Payment type, let's do check again just for convenience. So now our amount does not equal the total amounts being applied to the invoice in question. So we have a negative difference. And again, I'm going to be blocked. That difference must be zero for us to proceed. So those funds or something needs to be corrected. But now I don't have any extra funds to reallocate, I need to reduce the funds that I'm being applied to the particular invoice in this question. Same scenario, just have the invoice selected on our payment invoices grid, click our edit button, and we're going to change the amount from the balance due on the invoice to the amount that we actually received. Transaction description, Payment less $5.28, that's pretty verbose, but very specific. Click OK, and we're ready to go. Now that our difference is zero, click OK, and the professional platform, we always have to post. Just like that, always be able to edit the amount uh, of the distribution of the receipts to what the client actually gave us for. Very common questions, very easy to handle. 
for much more information on deposits, payments, miscellaneous cash receipts, cash receipts in general, we have another webinar, Accounting cor uh, Course 4, Receiving Payments, where we go into uh, great lengthy dis uh, descriptions and demonstrations on all of those topics. Let's take a look. Let's go to our client invoice window in our professional platform. Here's our invoice in question. This is where we had an, um, a balance due of 11.55.28. We have a payment of 11.50, and there's our balance due of $5.28. Carters are a very good client of us. We're currently doing two projects with them uh, in two different locations, so we may very uh, well choose not to bother them for the $5.28. But what do we do with that? That leads us to another common accounting question. And we would handle this particular situation with what we call an invoice adjustment. And that's one of the two ways to remove a balance on a client invoice. Crediting or reversing the invoice is the other, and that's the far more common of the two. And that can only be done for invoices that don't have any payments applied to them, as the invoice really be, will be reversed in its entirety. With that being said, if you find yourself making many invoice adjustments, you should probably contact our technical support department to ensure you're doing your invoicing um, correctly and your recording of payments properly as well, because you would, should not find yourself doing them time and time again. Invoice adjustments themselves have two uses, the first of which is to reduce um, an insignificant uh, under or overpayment, which is our situation. How do we enter an invoice adjustment? Well, in the professional platform, we're already where we need to be. On the client invoices window existing tab, click the adjust button, then the add button. For our design manager cloud users, just like most accounting activity, be on our documents and accounting window. Let's go down to the appropriate We'd select the invoice itself and hit the adjust button and click the adjust invoice amount. From here, the two platforms are very similar. So on our invoice adjustment window, very first uh, field that we come to besides the date is the GL account. Think of this very similar to the offset account in our miscellaneous cash receipt window. What account should we be affecting? Well, the invoice adjustment itself inherently is going to reduce the accounts receivable account. So the account must be something else. Accounts that it should not be, client deposit account, vendor deposit account, uh, cash accounts, those are all very common errors and they would manifest themselves down the road uh, in reporting or other areas uh, in negative ways they're going to cause their own headaches. So I always ask myself on the invoice adjustment window, what account should I reduce? Or even an even more simplistic way to look at it is, where should I record a loss, particularly in revenue or a loss in sales? Now, this is invoice 10,003. I could use a feature called the transaction search under our general ledger frame which gets us to our transaction search window, client invoices and adjustments, and I could put that invoice number into the transaction number. When I click find, that shows all of the accounts affected by that invoice. And it looks like as far as our revenue accounts, which are again the 40,000 uh, 40, accounts, majority of it's in furniture. So that would be a great place to take that small reduction uh, in sales of the 528. So we can go ahead and put that into our furniture revenue account. Transaction description, slight underpayment. And then in the adjustment button, it's uh, a frame, a uh, window itself, we want to input uh, the value to reduce the balance to zero. So since we have a balance due of a positive amount, we're going to put in 
a negative amount. And as we type, we can see the adjusted balance do reflects that. Click OK, and there's our invoice adjustment. And just like that, we're all set. Now, what is the effect there? Well, like I said, we're going to be reducing the accounts receivable account, and we're going to be reducing our furniture revenue account. And if we look on our accounts, go down to our revenue accounts, we can see there's a debit or a reduction in our furniture revenue account. And we can see the same in our accounts receivable asset account. will be blended right in to month seven. That will be a reduction there as well. Now, note, even though we're reducing the revenue and the accounts receivable of that invoice, that's got nothing to do with sales tax. So you're still liable for all of the tax that may or may not be on the invoice. You're just saying that there's going to be no more payment uh, upon that invoice is expected from the client. The tax authority doesn't care if you've been paid or not. You still know, uh, you're still liable for the tax the moment the invoice is created in accrual accounting. So keep that in mind as well. The second use for an invoice adjustment is to remove an invoice or uh, an unpaid invoice, uh, an unpaid portion of an invoice to quote unquote bad debt. Now, you could just credit or reverse the invoice uh, if it, there are no payments at all on it, but your accountant may find it advantageous for tax purposes to reclassify the loss as a bad debt, particularly if, if the invoice was from a prior fiscal year. So as another example, let's say that there was some issue with uh, the sleigh bread that we have for the Carter's Brigantine Beach Home, and they're simply going to not pay the invoice at all. If I want to classify that as bad debt, I simply highlight it, and like we saw, hit the adjust button, and use the adjust invoice amount selection. Today's date is just fine. Now, rather than using our furniture revenue account or something along those lines, I'm going to select some bad debt account. The bad debt account could really be classified either as a revenue account, and it would it would be uh, it would be recorded as a negative or a reduction in revenue, or some accounting professionals rather have it as a bad debt expense account. It's really up to their preference. Either by reducing the revenue or increasing the expense, uh, respectively, the net effect on the income statement is the same. You're going to have less income. I have it recorded as a revenue account. Transaction description. Oh, I don't know how about client disputing merchandise. The adjustment amount, again, the balance due is a positive, so I'm going to put a negative 1551. And we can see that our adjusted balance due goes down to zero. Click OK here. I'm going to be warned that we're adjusting the invoice. And now notice that the invoice drops out of the open invoices area and is shown under the paid closed invoices. And we can even see the adjustment is indicated uh, by the pencil icon uh, to differentiate it from a more traditional true payment. On the professional platform, as we saw, the adjustments are listed in their own column. Now, as a one last point on invoice adjustments, uh, do not use those when an invoice has been made an error, or let's say you found a sales tax issue, or you just need to fundamentally change um, what the client is um, being invoiced for at the given time, or wants something invoiced separately. In that case, simply credit the invoice in its entirety. Invoice adjustments are you manually manipulating the balance due upon it and reducing some other account appropriately. So like I said a few moments before, you're really only going to be using invoice adjustments in a more uh, in a far less common scenario 
and credit in the invoice itself. For more information on those topics, invoicing, crediting invoices, invoice adjustments, be sure to check out another one of our webinars, Accounting Course 2, Client Invoices and Billing Reports, and we discuss those uh, functions in great, great detail. Let's move on to another area that comes up uh, fairly commonly in the technical support team's day-to-day uh, -day questions, and that's going to be other transactions that are appearing in our checking or credit card windows. So let's go under our professional platform. Let's take a look at our checkbook window. And notice, back in June, we have a somewhat unusual entry on our checkbook window where it says other. This is one of those other transactions. And it's for a value of $250.24. It's almost as if that transaction is offsetting or reversing the payment we made to Verizon for our a cell phone and internet. But there's a lot of information in here because something appears is going to appear to be incorrect. And if there was a true issue with the payment to Verizon, we're not going to be able to reconcile our checkbook successfully. Within the other information in here, it shows us one, that this transaction is coming or being um, manifested from an operating expense. And it even tells us the transaction number in that TX number. So if we use our transaction search again, let's do type of operating expenses because that's what we're told the transaction is coming from and our transaction number, we can see here is the operating expense itself. Now, this portion to accounts payable is just fine. Whenever you put an operating expense in, until it's paid, the first account that gets hit or affected is the accounts payable account. The cash checking portion of it gives me immediate pause. The entry for Verizon wasn't against our checking account. It should be against some account representing what is the expense for or what is the what is the cause of the expense. And if we use our handy go to button here, that's going to get us to our vendor invoice uh, deposit and operating expense window. And we can see the entry itself. We can even look at the detail button here. And again, that matches what we saw on our transaction search window that we're immediately or um, directly affecting the cash checking account, which is not proper. We can also see that we have a debit card payment or automatic withdrawal associated with that uh, operating expense. So I can't edit it or avoid it. I need to first back out or remove the payment. So I like to jot down the the date, uh, check number if it was paid via check, so I'm gonna end up putting that information back in. So to correct this problem, we first need to void the payment for Verizon. Put that back into uh, June. And now that payment has been voided. That's gonna put the entry back on our pay bills window and we can see there's our oops, payments and checks. There it is, there's our Verizon bill. So we've reopened or marked that as unpaid. And now we can use our go to button. Notice that our associate check information um, is no longer entered and now we can make our edits. And here, after all of that, is the root of the problem. We're paying via check or some sort of withdrawal on our checking account, but the account distribution should be, what are we paying for? What is this expense? What caused the expense? The cash checking account didn't cause it. It should be some expense account. So we can edit our distribution.
and let's put that under our telephone or telephone and internet, for example. Once we make our change, we can save it. And then we can put back our payment information. Back on our payments and checks window, I can select our Verizon expense. These are hand check or wire and put our information back in. Six five and there's our account. And now if we look at our checkbook, we can see the entry still appears as a historical reference, but notice that the deposit amount has now been corrected. Very common, operating expenses that use a cash checking account uh, can cause all sorts of problems, but the information to track down or determine that if, uh, those errors are, is really provided for you if you simply know where to look. <clears throat> Here's another issue that may arise. Let's jump off of our checking information and how about we go to credit cards. If you're having a problem reconciling your credit card account and all of your uh, purchases have been selected and they match what the statement says and all the payments match, it becomes very difficult to track down where the issue arises. One way is if you ever notice that the opening balance from one month does not match the ending balance from another. So let's go back and take a look at some of our balances. So we can see, here's our American Express, our ending balance is 1365, opening balance is 1365, Ending balance of uh, of uh, May is forty ninety. Opening balance. Oh, there's a difference. And notice from the ending balance of May, which was four thousand nine ninety forty, and the beginning balance of June, there's a difference. That's an automatic red flag that there's a problem. And if we, look, if we note the difference between the two numbers, it's exactly $24.75. So perhaps that's an immediate indication that there could be a problem with the FedEx payment that we've entered using our credit card. So even here we have our go-to button, which again gets us quickly over to our transaction. Any payment or operating expense entered with a, a credit card, we can edit, and let's do so. And we can notice a very similar issue that we had on our checking account. We're already paying with our American Express. That's going to be how that account gets increased as it's a liability. But the account distribution should be what what account should the FedEx purchase be attributed to, or what did we buy, or what caused the expense? Not the credit card account. I would imagine it should be some shipping account. So we can change that as well. Just edit the distribution, stick that into the account. Let's go down to some inexpense accounts in gap accounting are usually in the sixes or 60,000s, and we could put that right under Postage and shipping sounds fine. Click OK. OK again. And now if we go back to our credit cards, let's take a look at month five. We have 40, 90, 40 as the ending balance. And we have 40, 90, 40 as the beginning balance in June. Very easy way to note that is going to be a problem and what month it's going to be resolving itself in is checking to see if those ending and uh, closing balances match precisely. If they don't, you will most likely have an issue when you're doing your uh, credit card reconciliation. Lastly, another concept of other transactions. There are five monthly 
subsidiary journals that design manager recommends that are to be reviewed at least on a um, timely basis we would love it to be monthly but yearly uh, would be a, a minimum and those five reports would be under accounts receivable the age of accounts receivable and the open client deposit and under the accounts payable the age accounts payable open vendor deposit and work in process design managers five monthly reports and in these reports at the tail at the bottom of them there's a figure that could appear there that would say other transactions or other transactions affecting affecting account let's take a look at what I mean let's go back to design manager cloud let's take a look at our aged accounts receivable report this is a listing of all of your invoices from your clients that are not yet paid in full. And notice there is an entry, other transactions affecting the accounts receivable account. The report balance itself is $12,063.98, but our current accounts receivable balance is $12,068.98. So the other transactions figure is forcing the final balance on the report to match the actual balance in the account. What gets attributed into this value is any is the sum of all transactions that are affecting, in this case, the accounts receivable account that are not quote unquote naturally shown on the report. And in the case of the aged accounts receivable report, natural or proper transactions would be invoices, payments, deposits being applied, etc. Unnatural transactions would include some of those we discussed today, journal entries, miscellaneous cash receipts that use the accounts receivable account, operating expenses where you put in the accounts receivable account. All of those would be uh, summated in that other transactions affecting account area. Now, in the case of the AIDS accounts receivable report, one of the first areas where I begin is I look at my sales journal. Let's bring that back to the beginning of the year. Recall our discussion on invoice adjustments. Well, one of the easiest uh, errors to be in, to uh, have on the accounts receivable report is to put the accounts receivable account into the invoice adjustment. And that's going to cause a problem. But the sales journal shows all invoice adjustments for us as a summary on that report. And lo and behold, there's a very suspicious $5 transaction. And guess what account it's using? The accounts receivable account. So we could easily fix that. On our invoice, we can see our adjustment where we're just, re as we did, reducing a uh, small underpayment. But unlike us, we, they, we use the uh, accounts receivable account when inputting it. Now, we can't edit the invoice adjustment, but we can void it. Doing so reopens the invoice but we can put it back in properly. So now if we wanna do our adjustment, put that in, back on 527. This was also for furniture. Oops, there's our furniture account. Slight underpayment and our adjustment. And now, if we look at our accounts receivable report, our other transaction value is no longer there. That's great. That's a very handy way to work on the accounts receivable report. 
uh, for some of the other reports, open client deposit, uh, work in process, open vendor deposit. That's another mechanism we can use. Let's jump over to our professional platform. Let's take a look at our open client deposit. And this is showing us all funds that we've received from the client that have not yet been applied to invoices. So these are either deposits or retainers that we've gotten from the client that have not been used in full on invoicing. And just like we saw in our accounts receivable report, we can see an other transactions amount here as well. How can we find where that be is? You can always use our transaction search window as a starting point. To do so, let's go to our transaction search. Oh, and for our design manager cloud users, the transaction search is on our documents and accounting, and the search button gets us to the exact same window if I didn't mention that previously. We want to focus on the client deposit account, so let's narrow it down by putting that into our account number. My deposits. And I want to start reviewing some of the transactions that we talked about today that we could, where we, we may use an inappropriate account. So let's make sure that we haven't used any operating expenses using the client deposit account because that would also <clears throat> be sort of counterintuitive. So if we use the type of operating expenses and click find, hmm, great, nothing was returned. So that's not the culprit. Miscellaneous cash receipts. Let's take a look at those. None. Fantastic. Journal entries. Remember how we talked about where journal entries could be used to indicate that funds were returned, but they may not have been done properly. <clears throat> we can use those as well. If we look at journal entries, <coughs> excuse me, ah, $2,000. There it is. So that's a journal entry that's directly affecting the account but it's not associated with any project. It's not been properly recorded. The account itself might be right, but the report never will be because of that journal entry. And if we use our go to button, we can see it was an attempt at refunding a retainer. So let's go ahead and put that in properly. Just by voiding the retainer, that'd be the part of me, the journal entry, now our report will no longer have our other transactions in. Ah, as we can see, they're gone. And let's now refund the Carter's retainer properly. When in doubt, when you're, all, when you're refunding the client anything, use the client returns and credits, which we can see under our accounts receivable, returns and credits. We're going to refund the retainer. Oops, All client. There is our Carter's Bringing Team Beach Home retainer refund. Now, like I said, we have an entire webinar associated with this, but just to show how it should properly be refunded, we could do a write a check, our refund amount, and we're ready to proceed. And just like that, now we've refunded the retainer, and we could even indicate that it was paid. Let's put that back when it was done. And if we look at our open client deposit report now, we can see the total amount of of, of uh, available retainer and deposit has been reduced by our $2,000, but we no longer have those other transactions. If we use the client returns and credits window, uh, you're almost guaranteed to process the refund properly and you won't have those other transactions appearing. Again, review our, um, our webinar on refunding or crediting your client, and I go into a multitude of examples on how to do so properly. And with that,
That brings us to the end of our discussion today on our common issues that our technical support department receives. And I really tried to focus on identifying them, how to correct them, how to avoid them in the future. So I'd like to thank you all for joining the discussion today, and I hope you attend another of our free webinars in the near future. Take care and have a great day.